Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I apologise uh, to my honourable friend for not being here to hear all of his speech, uh, and to the member opposite for not being here for his speech. Uh, I had hoped to be here for both speeches, but with the uh, length of the urgent question earlier uh, and another engagement out of this House, uh, I was unable to, um, to hear all of them. But um, I'm delighted to be here in time, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to make a contribution towards uh, this debate. So I do think, and as my honourable friend said, I think at the start of his remarks, the government's legacy on pension reform, I think, is one of its key acts as a government, that we have done, I think, a huge amount to transform the pension system that we inherited, uh, to uh, implement and he, auto enrolment, and the um, chairman of uh, working on the pension set committee who claims the credit for auto enrolment for the previous government, but my right friend was absolutely right to talk about the practical changes we had made to ensure it works. And I thought the, the very powerful point he made that the uh, take-up rate for smaller businesses, so we start to roll this out, it still exceeds expectations, it's very important. So there are other people who expect that take-up rate to fall. Uh, but I do think, I think it recognise that uh, many people across the country uh, who currently do not save towards retirement see auto run as a key way in which they can ensure they can protect themselves and their families uh, for uh, retirement. I think the changes announced by my right friend, the Chance, from the budget uh, giving people control over their pension pots when they retire, I think are important. But it sort of fits in with other reforms too. Uh, raising a state retirement age, introducing triple lock on operating state pensions, meaning that we have a state pension which is both fair and affordable in the long term. And the change that we made to pension tax relief as well, ensure that, that is both fair and affordable as well. And I think the cumulative effect of these reforms uh, is to ensure that people will save more towards their retirement, that more people will indeed save for retirement, that they will be rewarded for, for doing so, and we're treating those who do retire as grown-ups able to manage their own money. But I think the work that we've done so far is important, but I don't think the job is done. And this is why I think today's bill is so important. We know that under uh, defined benefit schemes, those in work knew that every year of their employment, they were building up a guaranteed pension income, a fraction of their final salary, and there was certainty. In building up that guaranteed income, once the employee had made their contribution, then the cost of providing that guarantee rests with the employer. If the investment return fell, then the employer had to increase their contribution. If employees and pensions lived longer, then again the cost of those changes were borne by the employer. That guarantee, of course, in a way, sowed the seeds of the decline in defined benefit con contribution schemes. Uh, it became increasingly expensive to provide that guarantee to employees. And that accounts for the decline we've seen in DB schemes uh, over, the, over a number of decades. And of course, under a defined contribution scheme, it's the employee who bears longevity risk in building up their pension pot. It's the employee who bears the investment risk. So certainly in, certainty in retirement, in return for fixed contribution by the employee, has been replaced by uncertainty, the cost of which is borne by employees. Now, the impact of that switch from DB to DC would have been mitigated if contribution rates had remained unchanged. But the impact of the transfer of risk has been compounded by the reduction in the level of contributions. The most recent figures I've seen from the ONS show that the total contribution rate for DB schemes is 19.2%. The rate for DC schemes is under half of that, at 9.4%. So what does that mean in practice, Mr Deputy Speaker? As the Department's own figures show, 11 million people between the age of 22 and state pension age will not save enough to deliver an adequate replacement income in retirement. So employees have seen a reduction in contributions to their pension scheme, they bear risks previously borne by the employer, and uncertainty about the income they will enjoy in retirement. So where does this bill fit into that picture? I think that defined ambition can, through guarantees, help provide greater certainty in retirement. I think the second area where these schemes can have merit is in maximising the return on pension contributions uh, for their members. The collective nature of defined ambition creates economies of scale on costs of running a pension scheme, which should help improve the overall returns for employees. Furthermore, the open-ended nature of a collective scheme can change the investment strategy of a fund. 
For an individual scheme as the employee nears retirement, the fund's objectives move from seeking capital growth towards locking in gains that have already been made, <coughs> providing greater certainty over the size of a member's pension pot. An open-ended scheme, and particularly a collective scheme, should shift investment strategy towards capital growth uh, and towards capital growth and away from simply locking that growth in, although I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. The second area where I think defined amb ambition will help is through the use of guarantees to deliver more certain outcomes for employees. As I said earlier, DB schemes, one of the merits of DB schemes for employees is that they guarantee an income. You know after a year's service you bank, depending on the scheme, an 80th, a 6th, 60th or 40th of a year's salary, or this year's salary or your salary at retirement. For a DC scheme, in fact, all you know is that you make contributions of X, have had net investment gains of Y, and whilst your pension statement will include a projection of a monthly income in retirement, it's based on how much more you contribute, investment gains between now and retirement, and annuity rates at the point of retirement. The only net thing you know for certain about that projection is it is going to be wrong. So the contrast between DC and DB schemes is stark. The question is, can you bridge that gap? between the certainty of DB and the uncertainty of DC. Now, I think the government's vision of DA, or, or shared risk schemes, is to secure, a quote from its, the, government's, the government's response consultation, is, quote, secure a guarantee on the income that will be received in retirement that builds up gradually during the savings period. Now, I think there's a great deal of merit in this. The employee has visibility and certainty of their income in retirement, one of the great assets of DB schemes. It will help people see how much they will have in retirement and crucially help them plan for retirement. However, the crucial distinction from DB is that in this case, in defined ambition, the employer's contribution is fixed. So if the income is guaranteed, then the cost of that guarantee must be borne by the scheme members. And I'd like to understand a bit more from the uh, financial secretary about what he expects those guarantees to look like and how he expects those guarantees to be financed. What proportion of a pension does he expect to be guaranteed? And presumably, in the same way that insurance companies have to uh, provide solvency res reserves uh, for guarantees that they issue, presumably defined ambition schemes will, be, will need to provide reserves to fund those guarantees. Now, I think that would be the case that the higher the guaranteed element, then the greater the shift in asset allocation away from risk-seeking and capital growth towards capital protection. In effect, the, facing, the challenge facing individual DC schemes, schemes now, but on an effective basis. Who will design the rules for determining the reserves to be held against the guarantees? Will that be the pensions regulator, or will it be the PRA, depending on whether the scheme is trust or contract based? Now, I do think the measures before us today do create opportunities for a new model of pension scheme. It will, I think, smooth some of the rough edges around the transition from DB to DC schemes. It should help reduce risk for employees. But it's not without its challenges, though. For this to work effectively, the schemes will need to meet a critical mass in terms of membership to enable the economies of scale to work their way through and to assure the sufficient flow of people coming into and out of the scheme, that there are new members and those new members balance the number of members uh, ceasing to be active members and those who are retiring. And the formula that drives the payouts from the scheme will need to be carefully thought through to ensure intergenerational fairness so that younger members are not subsidising pensioners. Now, in the Netherlands, schemes have been established on a sectoral basis, reflecting their particular social model. <coughs> and this helps deliver the critical mass needed for these schemes to obtain economies of scale and to smooth investment returns. How does my honourable friend think that schemes in the UK will achieve that scale? Does he envisage the schemes to be built up on a sectoral basis? Or do you envisage some master scheme set up that will be open to all uh, businesses? Just on that point. Yes, of course. Minister. I, I'm very much enjoying my rational my friend's characteristically uh, well-informed contribution. Just to reassure me on the point of industry schemes, when we visited the Netherlands to look at how this was run there, we did come across the Dutch tulip growers scheme. And I can reassure him that we, have, we don't have such narrow definitions in mind. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I'm not sure that tulips and the Netherlands are necessarily inappropriate. Uh, and that is all given, I think, one of the earliest financial crashes was the uh, tulip bulbs, the price of tulip bulbs. So it may not be a, a model to, to follow. Um, but I, I do, this point about sectoral and non-sectoral schemes is quite important because I think where the success has been in other countries is they have had a social model. 
uh, of relationship between employers and employees that we don't necessarily see here uh, in the in the UK. Uh, and you know, I think there will be uh, a question about how we actually encourage more employers to, to, to come together uh, to create these schemes, and perhaps there's a role for insurers to play uh, in, in doing that. Um, whilst the uh, schemes, scheme uh, aim to boost returns and try to offset some of the impact of undersaving, I think there is more that we need to do to help people save more towards retirement. As I mentioned earlier, uh, auto enrolment will help ensure that more people are saving. But as I said, the department's uh, own figures uh, say that some 11 million people would not be saving enough to uh, meet the recommended replacement income for retirement. Of course, if we look at contribution rates in other countries to their pension schemes, we see that the 8% rate in auto-enrolment lags behind that of other countries that have established innovative uh, pension schemes. In Australia, uh, the contribution rate to their super scheme is heading towards 12%, uh, and in the, the Netherlands, and my honourable friend mentioned the Netherlands, so I feel <coughs> liberty to talk about it, the contribution rates to those schemes are uh, over 20%, uh, significantly higher. Now, I think that though we have some way to go before we match those contribution levels, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I think it would be very wrong to contemplate at this point before the rollout of auto and roam has been completed to look at increasing the contribution rates. Uh, but I, we can't ignore the fact that people aren't saving enough towards their, their retirement. And we do need to find ways in which to help people build up uh, higher uh, contributions to have, a more, to have a, a, an income retirement, which is, I think there are ways we can do this. I, think we, I don't think we've done enough to uh, draw upon the insights from behavioural economics uh, initiatives such as Save More Tomorrow, which is adopted in some parts of the United States, uh, encourage people to increase their contribution rates when their pay rises, making a commitment today to see increases in contributions uh, in the future. I think we can look at the way in which fiscal incentives encourage those on low incomes to save more towards uh, retirement. And I certainly think that we can support people to make better choices uh, on retirement. I think that's a, a, a significant area that we need to focus on, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And indeed, the last point I want to touch on in my speech. As I said at the start, I think that uh, you know, we have introduced a series of radical reforms to the pension system uh, over the course of the last uh, four and a half years. But I think to make the most of the freedoms that we need, we do need to make sure that people have the support required to make the right choices. The right choices when they're building up their pension pot but also when they choose to use their pension pot. And that's why I'm very supportive of the guidance guarantee. I know that uh, the government's going to bring forward amendments uh, to this bill. I'm not sure it's the committee of the report stage uh, to introduce the guidance guarantee. Uh, but I do think it's an important part of the package legislation. Uh, I do, but I, I do believe we need to think about how we can encourage the industry to go further, to provide better guidance both before the point of retirement and after decisions we make at the point of retirement are ones I think we would want to come as individuals to revisit uh, later on. We need to find a service uh, that will help those who feel that they can't afford uh, independent financial advice without crowding out uh, IFAs. Uh, and we need to give people support to think about uh, drawdown, think about annuities, to think about type of products that are out there to help them maximise their income uh, over their, their retirement. And also to think uh, whilst people are saving, to think about what sort of lifestyle do they want uh, in retirement. Uh, and I think too often uh, people tend not to think about what they, would, what they aspire to in retirement uh, and tend to shape their retirement around how much they've saved rather than thinking about before they retire, well, this is what I'd like to do, these are the holidays I'd like to have, this is the sort of lifestyle I'd like to, to leave. And we need to give people more support in that. But I think to help uh, people make those decisions, I do think we need to harness technology to draw together details of people's savings, not just their pensions, uh, but also their ISAs and the bank savings, to put an end to the, 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 the complicating fragmentation of data, to encourage people to look at the totality of their financial assets, and to use that information to engage with their retirement planning. Uh, and I, yes, of course. Financial bills. The, the one asset he didn't mention in that list, of course, was the house people own, which I suspect as years go on, will increasingly become one people will have to consider using for their own retirement income rather than something they can pass on to their, their children, as perhaps we all hope to at the moment. Well, my friend makes an important point, and it was a, it was, uh, he was right to pick up on that, that omission. And certainly, I think, uh, when we think about retirement, <coughs> I think we should be talking not so much about pension, but actually what is people's income in retirement, recognising that, yes, some of that will take the form of state pension, 
some will be interest on uh, savings accounts. Uh, but you know, we will, some may be through work, depending on what point we're trying, how we phase our retirement. But certainly housing is a valuable asset. Uh, and I know there's, there's very good work being done uh, by a number of organisations to look at how housing can be used. But I think we're still some way off from having something that I think people will recognise as a good way to use uh, their housing assets. I feel, that my, I feel a letter coming on from my former colleague Nigel Waterson uh, on this point as I say that. But there is more work to be done to think about how people view housing as an asset and how they can utilise that asset in retirement to supplement uh, their, their income. I do think we need to uh, take the guidance guarantee and build upon that and build out beyond that. And that's something I'm sort of looking to do some more work on in the coming, coming months. I think the other thing I would just, just say, that it's a comment that's been raised with me, uh, and it's a comment I'll, I'll probably talk about in more detail when we get the, the, um, the, to the complementary tax bill uh, to this through uh, later in the year, is trying to make sure that we think about what sort of outcomes we, we do expect people to see in retirement. Uh, and the, uh, my reference from the pension minister referred to a decade of innovation. Uh, I think he and I will, will re recollect when we introduced reforms to liberalise the open market option and to make that more default, uh, that there were some challenges which were unforeseen when we did that. And we've seen some of the consequences of that in a re report published by the Financial Services Consumer Panel. Uh, and I do think there's a responsibility on the industry, the government uh, and the regulator think, to do some thinking about what, what does good look like uh, under the new reforms? Uh, how can we help shape that post-retirement market? Uh, and I think that will be a very important uh, part of the work going forward. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me uh, conclude uh, my remarks by, again, commending the government for its comprehensive package of pension reforms. Uh, I think they are a key part of our legacy. I think they're an important, uh, important way of expressing think, what we've achieved as a government, how we've set, some, set down some long-term foundations to help people take more responsibility for the saving retirement, to help people save more for their retirement and to give them the freedom and choice they need in their retirement. I think this bill is part of that package uh, and I look forward to seeing how these schemes develop to help provide people with, them, with more certainty around their future pension incomes at a time when actually all we've seen for them is increased uncertainty. <laughs>